I always start by saying it's probably the third place I've worked that says it's not like a traditional agency, but previously really isn't. We have this massive ventures focus. Now we're not seen as an expensive agency. We're seen as a I managed to kind of find my way into Vend. So when I first jumped on, like Vaughan Ferguson and Nick Holdsworth were the, the key people uh, I worked with there. The overview video was the first big project I did. Hey, I want to go back to the fashion company because I know that you had some challenging times. We had an opportunity to go into Commercial Bay. They worked with a whole lot of New Zealand labels to give them amazing retail space. COVID hit, the whole world gets shut down. We're done. Most people would just give up. You both didn't, why? Do you think the empathy of going through that gives you a different lens that you look through now when you're dealing with earlier stage companies? Every business is going to have some really hard times. In our early days at Previously, we've done equity swaps with companies. And it's a really great model, but we only ever kind of thought what could go right. How do you tell someone their baby's ugly? How do you have that conversation? This is another reason that we're a bit different than a normal agency. We... This week on the Business is Boring podcast... I'm chatting with Simon Pound. Simon, a partner. I was just kidding. It's the We Fucking Love Startups podcast, but we do get to chat with Simon Pound. Simon is one of my favorite humans. He has the most famous podcast, Business is Boring. He is ex-Vend, previously unavailable partner, working with Ice House to have a fund, but just a super cool guy. And he's never been a guest on a podcast before and he has chosen to come on our podcast because he loves us so much and we love him so much and you're going to love him watch this episode kia ora. thanks for tuning in to the we fucking love startups podcast brought to you by talent army But you've got like a like a whole media empire behind you and um, all the things at your disposal now that you're this like um, guy, puppet master pulling strings and all the yeah. pop. <laughs> the the spinoff is the best. Yeah. Like when I started that podcast, it was like seven, eight years ago and there were no business podcasts. There were no kind of like positive stories about business mm. in the world. And so because none of the other big media organizations had a podcast, it got super prominent, um, yeah. you know, was was number one, this, that, and the other, and was like actually quite a kind of like vital kind of thing to exist. But now there's so many podcasts, you know, like um, it really does come down to, you know, how much energy you put into it or the size of the media platform distributing it for you. So yeah, I've just been super lucky that that's the spinoff. Yeah, yeah. I it's, it's funny, right? Like a lot of people, I say, I'm, I'm not sure if they say this to you or not, but they'll go, oh, someone says got a podcast now, someone says got a podcast. And, and are you worried about them? And I'm like, oh, I don't care. <laughs> you know, like, I'm just going to do my thing and stay on my lane. And if people listen, thank you. If they don't listen and they listen to someone yeah. else, it's all good for them, right? Well, and a rising tide lifts all boats. Mm. And like, if people are making interesting content and telling great stories and people get better at appearing and sharing their story, it just makes everything better. Like, yeah, I love it. Like, this this is my favorite podcast. I'm yeah. so, stoked to, so stoked to be invited. Thank you. Dude, I've been listening to your podcast since, you know, since because you started that, what, just just after you left Fend? Yeah, before even. Before, yeah. 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 And so then, like, I've been listening to that, like, religiously for like mm. years and years and years and you have a, a much better voice for podcast than I do. A great face for radio. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dude, how sad was your last day on the morning show? The AM show? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've just been going to that. I used to get invited on to these media things because I started out as a media reporter mm. and so they'd get me on to be kind of the young person who was doing politics and media stuff and then I think they just kind of like forgot to stop inviting me and now <laughs> mm. <laughs> now I'm on in quite a different way uh, but yeah I used to go on because it was the Paul Henry show and then I've just kind of stuck around like a barnacle. Are you still doing it? Yeah well I, no, no it's over like, yeah, there's, no more, like, yeah. there's no more AM show. But you're not going to do you're not going to. I've outlived the industry I'm like a. Yeah that's crazy hey what's what's going to happen with media now do you think? I reckon that We've never been better served for media ever, if you care about it and go and look for it. But there is something so important about there being like a a central experience. And now that we don't have a world where everyone watches the six o'clock news or everyone's reading the same newspapers, like that's that's a real worry for like mm. what do we have in common and what's kind of the 
uh, you know, universally understood measure of this is reality kind yeah. of thing. Like, I think that's actually quite a concern. And I don't know how to solve that one. But in terms of like the media, if you're doing stuff that's high value for a high value audience, like Business Desk, NBR, you know, there's so much room for high quality media. But if you're in the middle and you're just like not doing something that's super valuable that people mm. will pay for, pretty hard to see how advertising supported models can continue yeah it's weird it's and it's the thing i find interesting because we have a, a plethora of media like podcasts and youtube shows and tv shows and news and everything now that it's almost like people are like trying to pull you into their little world all the time like mm. you know you have to watch this and listen to this and this and this and we're like there's all these little groups now of like people around the internet that do these things and i'm just like i just love conversation i just love mm. even if something even if i hate it i like watching it because i get what well, made me think you know still think you're a dick but you know it made, made me think or i think you're awesome now and you changed my mind and so yeah i think like i started out as a reporter and i actually left the news because i thought it was pretty dishonest and mm. advertising was more honest like so much of the news is based on this idea that like you know they're the purveyors of truth and all of this kind of stuff but the six o'clock news for example is probably the worst way to yeah. get information you possibly can about important events and they never have enough context about what's happened before or what things mean and then you just get two people who have opposing opinions and get them to bat butt heads and look for a soundbite that's bad kung fu yeah. right because like you're not going to get anywhere if you're just hitting heads and then it's off and it's like well let's solve the israel palestine conflict in 30 seconds with two people who disagree with each other and it's like it, it's no more heat you know yeah. more, more, no more light it's just just heat and so yeah um and it's a product that's meant to kind of keep you watching it and and scared and angry and all the mm. rest of it um so they can sell ads. Or you can just go and sell ads and be much more honest about it and say, hey, we're, we're communicating with you to try and get your money off you and to promote things that we're trying to promote. So it's like quite a lot more of an honest uh, kind of transaction. And that was what yeah. actually led me from, I, I worked on a media show on a terribly earnest, um, but really kind of like such great people trying to do really great work on a station, TVNZ7, that no one watched like it was like just crickets but we were doing all the stuff that we thought was important critiquing the media made no impact on anything and then kind of left very disillusioned in media do you do you have do you follow like youtubers like um i have like youtube investigative journalist media young people that i follow that i'm like i, I just love watching their content you know like there's an andrew from channel five mm. if you've ever come across him in the states not not so much oh, like so so i've good. detached from so much news that isn't kind of um, really considered. So I'll read weekly cycle news and listen to, uh, you, you know, things that are wrap ups that are got quite a lot of context, uh, mm. very vetted sources, like read the New Yorker, like try, try not to be part of, uh, too much, too much news. Mm. Yeah. I, I like, I just love people that are like not sponsored, not, mm. not pressured into telling a story and just seeing where their stories go. And, but yeah, it's, it's a crazy world we live in now. We have so much choice and so many people you can follow. Mm. Um, I really love that you said you were going to come on and talk about your favourite guest and the one that the, you said the particular one that you hated the most. And so um, we can get stuck into that, taking the piss out of you. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, have we, have we started yet? <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Hey, so you obviously you started in media mm -hmm. and then like I met you – you know, at Vend as mm -hmm. the guy at Vend who was across brand. Mm -hmm. um, and you're very passionate about brand now, but that hasn't been your, like, you've had a journey, right? And then your wife and you started a company together mm -hmm. and there's a big story there. So I want to try and cover a bunch of topics and then get into now that you're, you know, this big VC guy. You know. <laughs> <laughs> With the smallest VC fund in town. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. me. But you've probably got one of the better portfolio companies mm -hmm. on, on the books, right? And so it's um, potential there for to be one of the bigger ones in the future. Mm -hmm. So how did you, like, like how, before I met you at Venn, tell me that story. Like, how did you then get into the tech startup world? Yeah. So, yeah, started out in reporting and was a media and politics reporter and then decided that the <laughs> news was less honest than advertising, so moved to advertising. And that was fascinating because there's something really cool about big brand advertising because you're making like little movies and little vehicles of likableness uh, so that people will enjoy something that 
doesn't really mean anything. Yeah. It's quite a weird kind of world to be in. And so I worked in kind of big brand stuff at agencies like um, Contagion and Saatchi by Sa Saatchi and Saatchi and worked on what was telecom and um, ASB and, and, and things like that. And it was really fascinating to learn how these utilities, these really big companies like telcos or banks that are completely undifferentiated from their competitors just do storytelling to make people kind of like them and really love that. And then at a certain point um, while I was working in advertising, my wife and I had twins and fashion pays people miserably. And so we were kind of used to being poor and broke and tired and stuff. Can we, can we just mention who your wife is? For, oh, yeah, because yeah. she's quite a big deal in fashion, not yeah, just, you know, yeah. throwaway line there. Yeah, in Ingrid Starr <laughs> uh, is, is, is my wife, was, was, wasn't then, but is now. Um, and yeah, so we, we were kind of used to not having much. And so we thought we may as well just start a label rather than go back to work, uh, you know, for the income and the difficulty with kids at home. We had twins and the like. And so... Um, through that, I got to start using Vend, which mm. was so cool. And it just was like one of these light bulb moments in life. The first was uh, Zero that I was using as a freelance writer and um, creative and video maker. And I couldn't believe how accounting, which had always been pretty challenging for me, mm. like it seemed like a lot of nonsense and a lot of rules that didn't make a lot of sense. And then Zero made it all super clear. And I was like, well, this, this is cool. And then Vend was the same thing. It was like all of this is moving to the cloud uh, using things like iPad is just so uh, – it's just going to change the whole industry. And so then I managed to kind of find my way into Vend um, through a good man, Campbell McLean at Dreamus, and we went and saw Nick Holdsworth and then um, started making a few videos and then got into that company as I was just so excited about the prospect of the cloud. Do you Because you made the original sort of like – Blowing up the register videos and stuff, didn't you? And, and some recruitment videos, wasn't it? Yeah, a few things. So that company had always really cared about brand. And mm. that's why they were able to pull someone out of a um, big agency uh, to work there. And I actually took like a, I had to go in on half-time wage because couldn't afford to go in full-time as they mm. didn't have like a um, advertising uh, agency kind of wage available. And then I kept doing freelance half-time until I came on full-time uh, because I was so keen to jump into startup land. Um, mm. Absolutely loved it. But that company had always cared about brand. Like Vaughan and Nick had done really cool brandy things like from the absolute get-go and they had this like energy and um, authenticity to it. And they had done stuff like um, to show how their PayPal partnership worked, which you could take payments anywhere. They went to um, one of the skydive schools that used them in Australia and jumped out of a plane and then filmed it like doing a transaction as they fell. And that's the kind of thing where if you don't have as much money as other people, you just do more interesting shit. And then do you know the story of work? the PayPal CEO at the time? He, he got that and showed it to the company and was like, we've got to be more like these people yeah, yeah. and we got to do more with these people. So they had that DNA there, like it was really part of the company. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I love that I asked you that question. Like, of course you would know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Similar to you, but I, I wasn't smart enough to do half time. I was like, I'll just take half of a salary. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had a fashion business and, yeah. and twins to support. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so I, I was like caught up in the – just the videos that I saw online mm -hmm. and just this narrative of like this brand and this business and they were who they were and they were fun and they were renegade-y and so like it just appealed to me. And so then when I were like, the, the opportunity to come and join them, I was like, well, I feel like I'm already part of your story. You know, oh, like, they, they believed in it so much. So when I first jumped on, like Vaughan Ferguson and Nick Holdsworth were the, the key people uh, I worked with there over the, over the time. And like the overview video was the first big project I did. And all of the overview videos at that time were these super slick, lonely sandwich influenced videos that had like a kind of San Francisco hipster and yeah. nice clean Apple devices and someone on an organic bicycle or something. And they'd all do all these little graphic motion things. And we priced that up and we couldn't afford to do a better version than what they were doing. Like they were like 200 grand or something. And so we went, well, what can we do? on our budget and how can we go the exact other way than everyone else and so I came to them as my first kind of big project there and said okay we're going to work with this I, I think we should work with this amazing paper um, stop motion 
uh, director, art director woman named Sally Tran, who's this you know fa- fantastic director who makes the kookiest stuff. And we should do everything paper, and we should have people on leotards, like dressed up as the world, and we should do stuff with like bazookas and have like a human pyramid. And they just kind of like went, oh yeah, okay, sure, you know, let's let's give it a go. Like we've got to stand out. And that video ended up being like extremely uh, effective and people who watched it were more than twice as likely to then become customers. Yeah. So it paid itself off in months and it was such a brave move. But because Vaughn and Nick were like brand builders at heart, they just backed it from the get-go. Do you wish that all your clients were like that when you were back in agency days, mate? <laughs> yeah, you, know, you still are, right? But I but think like after six years at Vend, I moved into previously and I, I did kind of think that because Zero and Vend had been two pretty pretty well known successes in a small scene for really caring about and investing in brand. And like at Vend, we learned a lot from Zero. We went and saw like Pat McPhee was a great, great kind of mentor at certain points and we really followed their their, their playbook. Mm. And I thought, okay, well I'll come out and help a whole bunch of other um, companies do this. And some companies completely got it straight away. Like Ryan Baker at Timely, absolute yeah. legend leader, he he called me up and was our first client at, at previously because he wanted to really embrace brand. But there were quite a few companies we'd get in there and do a project with one person in the company who cared about brand. And then it would get up to like the board. And a bunch of like hoary old hardware dudes would go, Oh, I don't like brand. I don't I don't like the look of this. I don't think we should do it. And they just kill projects. Mm. So yeah. Why it, is that? Why do you think that's the case? I think they scared? I think we're just not a very mature industry yet. But in the last three years, I've seen a lot of that maturity come through where I think what we think um, good behavior would be is that if you're a board member and you see a brand project and you don't feel like you know about brand, it should be the same as getting a legal opinion. If a legal opinion comes in that you don't like, you don't go, oh, I don't like it. I don't yeah. think we should do it. You go... I'll go get another opinion from someone who's qualified. And that would be really good behaviour. And we're seeing more of that happening where mm. we're doing a bit, bit of work with um, the wonderful team at Onboard to try and actually create some advisory boards where people can go to brand and marketing leaders and bring that um, bring that skill in. Because I really think, and, and we're seeing some really good examples of this happening, that Bringing in that kind of brand marketing and design to tech companies is a huge unlock for growth and quality. Yeah. I, I 100% agree with mm-hmm. you. Like, I've built my whole business off brand and mm-hmm. having fun and just being myself online and, you know, like trying to get. Well, I, I, I remember when I set up Telling Army, I was like, the one thing that I focused on was. I'd call it a Jerry Maguire approach, right? Which mm. isn't less about show me the money, but hopefully one day. Um, but like less clients, more business. Mm. I really wanted my clients to know who I was and to get me and I wanted to stand out a little bit. And so I just experimented with brand and mm. things online. Um, I wasn't fortunate enough to have a lot of money to pay an agency. But mm. so I'm really passionate about people pushing their some themselves out there and now their brand mm. and not to be controversial, but to having a have a like a space in the market that people go i know them you know like i get them and i feel their story and so what do you say like if you were to think about your career now like what are the moments for you that you were like i got to work on this really really cool thing Mm -hmm. other than that that venn story is there moments you can you recall straight away yeah like so proud of that venn story right though like it was um such a magic environment with so many the people. Because did go on to do some really cool stuff as well? Like oh she, yeah, yeah, she's she's done heaps of cool yeah, stuff. Yeah. We'll we'll continue to, but like yeah, like the the ability to actually like the the thing we really did at, at, at Vend was move it to be a brand in its industry, and this is the the amazing thing with um, brand, right? Like what is brand? Like it's kind of one of those words that means everything and nothing, and so often people in the past would have just and 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 this is maybe why those kind of hoary old hardware people are suspicious or skeptical about it is that people would kind of say anything that didn't work was brand but don't worry it'll come back in the long term and um you know it was the kind of the half of marketing that you couldn't measure or didn't know if Mm. it was working but like brand is really about making something for your customers and making an idea and then expressing it through how you look how you turn up in the world the activity you do, the content you make, the events you put on, and then that idea attracting 
the kind of customers, the kind of partners, the kind of team that you want to work with, and then you all get together to make something. And right now, most technology brands are actually just technology brands. Mm. They're actually like um, selling software to an industry. And this massive opportunity that pretty much every technology brand has is to stop being, if, if you do have a really homogenous customer group that you serve, stop being a software company selling to retailers uh, or for timely software companies selling to hair and beauty people and start being a retail brand selling software or a retail brand mm. uh, or a hair and beauty brand selling software. And doing just that track and reflecting back your audience and making something about them and truly in your product designing it to help them have better lives and be about fulfilling something in their world means that you will have uh, a much more successful business mm. and so yeah really really rewarding when you do get to do those projects and we've done it with um working, working with the others at vend uh timely they they we helped at the beginning and then they executed it magically and then, yeah, we kind of keep doing it. And it's fantastic that there's still an opportunity to be doing this. Recently did it with um, Posboss, who we worked with uh, and changed the name to Bustle. Um, working with MenuAid, who uh, we, we, we're just about to have a rebrand um, pop out with. Yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's, it's super rewarding. I love the team there at MenuAid. Mm. Oh, they're, they're wonderful. Yeah, yeah, cool people, man. Cool. Mm. And VP's just gone there. Yes, yeah, VP. Yeah, yeah shout yeah. out, Vanessa Rett. Yeah, awesome. VR well, we now, mm. yeah. Um, so what is like so previously unavailable right mm. like what is it for people that don't understand what it is I always start by saying like it's probably the third place of work that says it's not like a traditional agency uh, <laughs> that like no one ever says that, that they are but previously really isn't because we have this massive ventures focus so um, the bits that I look after it previously uh, we've got like a venture studio where we swap equity for services uh, with brands yeah we also just do fee, fee projects as well. Um, we've got our brand fund where we have, with Ice House, raised a fund to invest uh, in companies where brand will be how the much, defining part did, of their how business. How much did you raise? Set up to raise two and then ended up with just over four. And it's pretty cool. Like, yeah, that's that, awesome. That's really changed. Um, it's changed the way we work with people and changed our business. It's been, been fantastic. Um, In what way? Well... Like with those conversations with people who might not have been that comfortable with brand, like skeptical to cynical, now we're not seen as like a expensive agency. We're seen as a capital partner who might be a source for more money in the future. Mm. So where possible, what we do is we do equity swaps to do brand projects on the same terms as we do brand fund investments. And that way it's really clean for everyone. Mm. And so that, that's the bit that I look after um, uh, with, with, with the team. And then we've also got a big brand kind of function that works with bigger brands that wouldn't be equity swaps. And so education perfect and um, you know doing a bunch of strategy work for Zuru. And then we've got an innovation uh, for, for part of the business too who do big projects with like Fonterra and you know companies who are trying to, um, yeah, like actually do innovation in a way that, works as opposed mm. to the old corporate innovation ways that, that, yeah. that don't. How many people have you got now? That previously? But about 20, just under. Like you're doing a lot for 20 people, man. Yeah, well, we don't want to get any bigger. Like the, the most exciting thing that we do is actually help to co-create companies. And so with our friends at TRA Labs, we've launched Tracksuit and Ideally, which is really exciting. And mm. so what we want to focus on is like helping to launch these companies give them the scaffolding and support to get going, help kind of sort out the product market fit of the product, create an amazing brand and experience, and then hire amazing operators and just step back. And it's so cool. Like, you know, um, really enjoyed your chat with Connor on the pod and mm. just the perfect example, like him, the Ideally team, um, you know, him and, and, and Matt, you know, like so great to get these operators in who then pick it up and we had a lot to do with the first few months and yeah. then all of the success is the work that, that they put in after that. Yeah, that's like probably as I, I'm the zero to one guy. So like mm. I like having an idea and then getting out of the way and letting people who actually know what they're doing run it. And so if I was going to create a studio or an agency or something, that sounds like my happy place. You know? Yeah, and like 20 people is a great number. Mm. So we've got like 
amazing design team um you know just totally world class uh, people in that we can make beautiful websites we've got a, a person who does beautiful content and then we've got our strategists and 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 and, and support people and that's great. Like we can now do a bunch of these things a year, but as you get bigger, it's actually a massive overhead. And I, mm. I think you know you would have experienced this as the person who was bringing so many of the people in at Vend. But when a company goes on just a massive growth journey, you actually take your eye off the ball, right? You put so much energy into growing mm. systems, operations, hiring the right people, um, and and being a great company is a lot of focus when you really want to be focusing on the value you create for your customer and just be like as extraordinarily focused on that as you can be to succeed. Yeah, I haven't like, so we grew telling Army quite quickly, you know, 18 months ago because mm. the market was going crazy, right? Mm. And I sort of stepped back and wasn't running the company and was freelancing with, you know, like, am I going to do something else? And so I sort of had one foot in, one foot out. And the company was growing with so many people and there was processes spinning up here and this and that. And I thought, I remember thinking like, um, are we still working? Mm. You know, are we still doing the things for our clients? Because mm. my clients are calling me saying, what's going on? We haven't seen any CVs, but it seems like everyone's really busy over here. Mm. And so trying to find that balance for me is something that I've always struggled with because mm. I'm very client first as a, like, I'm mm. such a services guy, you know, like I'm always thinking, is that client getting the best possible value out of me? And if I'm spending three hours working on a, a new mm. byline on, you know, like mm. a new workflow tool or whatever it is, you know, it's... I feel like I might be wasting time sometimes, but yeah. you can't scale without it, right? So well, Yeah, you want to have, like, because we've now got, like, amazing general manager and support team, and that is huge for unlocking the ability yeah. to do more good work. But you've got to be careful, right? Because if, you, if you're not careful, you can spend all day doing what seems like work but doesn't actually put value to clients and doesn't um, do things. And so what we have this massive focus on, which is what makes us different, is that we actually want to increase the enterprise value of the companies we work with, which means that by being equity partners or investors, we can then, you know, benefit from that, as opposed to the actual only way that agencies can make money, which is increase your billing. Yeah. And that's not, that's like a direct, um, <laughs> that's directly against what the enterprise actually wants to do to get better. They don't want to be paying an agency. They want to hire their own marketing and design team mm. and then be able to do that as cost effectively as possible. And that's how you build venture value. Mm. And so, yeah, our focus is how do we build venture value? And that means just sticking to the parts that we're super useful at. Is there anyone else doing venture? Like, is there any other brand funds that you know of around mm. Asia Pacific? Not in Asia Pacific. And I think there are funds that do CPG. And mm. I think that's the other thing with brand. Like, it's very mentally available to think of like something that Jake Paul or Kendall Jenner make or, um, you know, a nice drink with a nice brand uh, asset. And it's not really that that we're trying to work with. We're looking for especially B2B SaaS companies mm. where they have a homogenous audience so you can become a brand for your audience. And by homogenous, I mean like, you know, majority of your customers are one type of thing. Yeah. So then you can do a business to business brand that's actually a bit more like a business to consumer brand because you're talking to a kind of consumer. So if it's like retailers or beauty therapists or tradies, you know, like that's a that's a customer. So yeah. you can actually talk to them in the vernacular and in a way they care about. And that's that's the really exciting thing. So that kind of focused uh, fund where we're trying to invest in kind of scalable companies where brand can be a competitive advantage, it's pretty rare, pretty mm. rare. Yeah, no, indeed, man, indeed. Hey, I want to go back to um, your the fashion company because mm. I know that you, around the time that we were working together, had some challenging times, right? Mm. And I really respected what you and Ingrid did to – get out like push out of that and the way you were able to keep going and you know getting money back and mm. so i'd love if you can sort of talk through that story in a quick version if you can yeah man it's like um it feels like a lifetime ago now though it does and like it was a really hard time so i think the fashion business has been so great as 
it's like my wife's vocation like yeah. she's just amazing at it and when we started um and it's also brought about all kinds of other cool stuff like getting intervened and you know meeting so many great people and um you know we, we did some pretty cool stuff but like the fashion business at, at base it's just so balked, you know, like when we got into it, there was still a path. So, so what? Oh, balked. Like it's just nuts. It's low margin and low volume yeah. and incredibly mature market. And there are really sophisticated operators. And then there are a whole lot of enthusiasts who don't know what they're doing and who muck up the, the, the general economics of the whole thing. So it's like definitely not for the faint hearted. And we went in on a very kind of... Um, ethically based approach wanted to be New Zealand made really celebrate the makers use natural materials yeah. um, all of that makes for very expensive fashion uh, very expensive to produce and then with the retail model you know you're, you're looking at like if you make a t-shirt it costs you 200 bucks to sell you, you can't sell it for less than like 200 bucks you can't just put, like, make yeah. it the season <laughs> and put New Zealand made on the tag no which but you don't you try not to do too many kind of t-shirts for that reason yeah. right? like you can't you can't make the money back and so, yeah, it's a really hard business to work in. And that was why I wanted to work in SaaS businesses and stuff as an offset. But yeah, there was a path to it working when we started, which was you get into an Australian department store. This is like 2009, which yeah. in internet um, e-commerce years is like a million years ago. You get into an Australian um, big re department store and like 20 Australian retailers, and then you've got enough scale that you can operate in New Zealand. Yeah. And all of the great brands like the... Um, Kate Sylvester's and the Carol Walkers, like they did really well from their Australian sales, and then the New Zealand market was, you know, cover itself, but not, not, yeah. not, not the biggest part of the business. But then somewhere during our, um, you know, operating, we got up to having, uh, you know, two to three stores in Auckland, twenty plus stockists around the country. At one stage, we had twenty stockists in Australia, and then that pulled back as um, they they had a little crash there. Um, but yeah, like it's still not at scale. Like you need to be quite big to make scale. And we'd built up and built up and along the way Australia changed and so department stores no longer broke labels to their customers. They actually expected labels to bring customers in the door. Mm. And just this massive change where department stores, which we're seeing with why Smith and Co and the like are having trouble, right? They used to bring the world to people, but now you've got Instagram and the internet yeah. and the world's the world's there you know yeah. so the whole model changed and we nearly got there we got up to kind of one mil plus a year of turnover and had like great customers and great support and after a couple of years of that which was just break even and not really enough to um to, to survive we had an opportunity to go into commercial bay and they were looking to do something really cool which was get companies that you don't find at malls so they got an amazing food court which mm. is all actual kind of independent cool food retail mm. and then they worked with a whole lot of New Zealand labels to give them amazing retail space and so we were super excited like um, and in an alternate world that might have been us just made and I'd be sitting here going oh it's pretty good you know we yeah, my fashion empire worked yeah. hard for a few years and then we got to like scale and you know yeah. it's, it's clear and kind of 100 grand a year and we're happy and everything's great um, but in the in the meantime between us signing up for that store COVID hit and so Commercial Bay was three months delayed and we'd already committed to make double as much stock as we normally had to you know be, yeah. be part of that um, that store and so we just got hit with a moment where we made this leap we shut a store and then went to open that so we were just within our same kind of operational footprint yeah. but needed more stock and thought we'd be doing more trade and instead the whole world gets shut down we're not an essential service Everyone else is in the same boat, and so no one else has been open. And so we looked at like where we were. We went, man, there's no way we're going to sell enough of the stock at enough margin when everyone else is fire sailing that we will be able to pay it back. And we're, we, we're so committed from this jump and not trading for four months. Um, shit, we're, we're, we're actually like, we're done. Like, mm. we can't do anything else without trading while insolvent. So we'd see a couple of like... But then at that moment, right, most people would say, all right, we're insolvent, we're going to go bankrupt, we're going to mm. write everything off and just give up. Mm. But you you both didn't. Why? Would have been pretty bright too, actually. <laughs> um, but like, there's this idea, right, that business is some kind of um, 
individualistic pursuit. But anyone in business properly knows that's not true. And so our business was kept afloat by the suppliers who would work with us and give us um, fabric and do, do, do sewing and the like. It was all local. And, you know, there, there were dyers and, 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 you know, people who were, um, yeah, yeah like, like everything, everything is, is, is local and we knew them all. And so us going out of business means all of those people not getting paid. And we found ourselves to be kind of 400k in a hole and we didn't have any other resources to go. We tried to sell our house, didn't sell. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was a real shit show. Um, and then we went out to our crowd and said, hey, this is the situation we're in. Um, you, you know, we, we took a big jump and the cliff kind of ran out and mm. ended up being in, in big trouble. And we were so lucky, the support we got. So... Um, we, we decided to make the responsible lucky, call. Lucky? Is that the right word? Yeah, re real lucky, actually. Like, su not, super lucky. Do you not think that, you, like, the respect that you had from your crowd paid dividends? Well, a lot of, a lot of brands that had people who um, cared about them were in the same spot at the same time. And, mm. I mean, I think maybe we moved a bit earlier than a lot of people because we went to some liquidators and they said, look, you know, there's no way we can see that you can get out of this without trading while you're insolvent. And we didn't want to do that. And then we talked to Commercial Bay and I've got to give a, a huge shout out to Precinct Property because they are the reason we're not bankrupt. So property empires <laughs> never let you out of your lease. It's kind of what mm. the whole business is based on. And we went to them and said, look, you know, we, we've got a personal guarantee against this. and We can't see how we can like trade through and they were like oh it'll be fine you know bring your accounts and we'll have a look at them and they had a look at them and they were like oh no no you're you're fucked like <laughs> <laughs> oh no and so they they let us get out of the lease which like actually changed our lives so that's unheard of and, and, and unheard, and instead of being bankrupt and instead of um you, you know having a mortgage sale of our house and like being back to absolute square one after 10 years of building a business we were able to then go out and say hey we're in the spot we're on the front page of the Herald, our big silly mugs looking all sad. And, you know, um, we were kind of like a face of COVID failure, which mm. was definitely not on my plan for starting a business. But um, it really did help us in that people, they shot the sale early and when it was still, even though they knew we were in a fire sale situation, yeah. they could kind of hang back. And lots of people like, yeah, just, just, just helped us. And so we then took the rest of the stock under the house, changed to a made to order model, just kept innovating and changing, like tried a whole lot of things so we wouldn't have to have speculative stock. And over three years, we paid back the entire 400k hole by not paying ourselves and, and the, the friends and family who supported the business, you know, by buying shares in it early on. They've had a horrible ride, but we'll, we'll sort them out one day. But yeah, like all of the um, 400k of uh, debt We've, we've managed to whittle down over over those years. So that's been a party, but um, real good to be over. <laughs> mm. Yeah. What are you, what is that? Like if you were to, if you're writing your book right, mm. on how to do business later in life, right? Mm. What's that, what's that chapter? What are the key points in that chapter of learnings? Feel so lucky that we were able to communicate. Because if we weren't able to communicate with our crowd, we would have been completely screwed. I mean, there was the option just to liquidate, but that wouldn't have been kind of right with our morals and ethics. Mm -hmm. and I think, you know, you always hear this advice that like, you know, one of my favorite um, quotes is the Winston Churchill, if you find yourself in hell, keep going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, like you just have to push through it. And I had the whole, you know, raft of things like, you know, like a burnout breakdown. Like it was just so stressful. It was so hard. Um, but we got a lot of support from people around us and that helped us get through. So if you do find yourself in a lot of trouble, you, you really do have to reach out and tell people what's happening. And it's not fun. Like it was not fun to be the face of failure. And it's quite funny, you know, we were you know, literally front page of the business here, massive full front. And then when we paid it all off, it was like, the arrival newspaper did a tiny online story. <laughs> so you're like, oh, well, you know, that's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't make a great that's story. That's how it goes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. No, that was like the, the newspaper wanted to... They had me all over the newspaper when I get hit by a truck, mm. you know, and then they were like, do you want to come on the TV? And all. I was like, all the things that I've done in my career and this, yeah. is, this is what you want? <laughs> this crippled guy, you know, like they got hit by a truck. Oh, I mean, yeah. part of a new PR strategy anytime there's a big announcement, like, yeah, get, get, get in front of a truck. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I've got to do that. Um, so do you think do you think that and like without being 
cliche cheesy startup podcast like and how does it transcend into startups mm. but do you think the empathy of going through that gives you a different lens that you look through now when you're dealing with these earlier stage companies or companies where you're looking at capital mm. opportunities every business is going to have some deep troughs right mm. some really hard times and i think in our early days at previously so since since i came over um we've done equity swaps with companies uh, in return for work. And it's a really great model, but we only ever kind of thought what could go right. And um, one of the cool things about working with Ice House Ventures is that Barnaby especially has been phenomenal for helping us go, okay, well actually before we get to that, let's think about are all the preconditions for success there? Um, you know, Will they be able to keep raising money? Is this the kind of person who can build a team? have they got a great team around them? Like, who's going to help them when things get hard? And those kind of questions are really key before you go, mm. is the idea great? You know, is, is the market big? And that's a really important thing. Like, it's the founder is mythologized to a huge degree, right? But it does all come back to the founder. Like, the stress will sit on them. And you want to make sure that they've got a really good team around them to help them get through those yeah. tough times. Yeah, we talked about that like this before mm. podcast, right? Mm. In terms of the resilience of someone mm. and backing the person, because you know they they may be the right person, have the wrong idea and the wrong brand for the wrong idea, and then you back them for the longer term play and they pivot, and then then success comes, right? And so it really is like resilience is such a such a huge trait to have in the startup yeah. world that almost drives us all crazy. Well, but one thing that really has helped is, you know how like people say, you may as well try and make a 10 million business, not a 1 million business, because it's the same amount of work. Yeah. That is 100% true. Like the amount of work and effort and difficulty we did to run a million dollar business was so hard compared to what you can do in a software company. Yeah. So, you know, if you are going to really commit yourself Try and do something that's properly scalable, that has great unit economics, that more people want tomorrow than today, that isn't in a mature industry. Like you're going to work really, really hard yeah. no matter what you do. Try and pick the best preconditions. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that I think very, very hard about. It's like, boy, you don't want to be just just paying the bills. Would you go again, you and Ingrid? Would you do something? Oh, we, well, we're still, we're still trading through. Um, and Ingrid is now doing a made-to-order model mm. where, you know, there's 10 years or 15 years now of fans of the brand who love her um, style and clothes. And so she does a lot of, like, um, suiting and special uh, wear, and then there's styles available on the website. But it's just a season of life where we've got teenager kids and lots going on, and so it's not a full, huge focus. Yeah. But I think the model we're in now it's actually great. Like it's more profitable than it's ever been. It's less pressure. And, you know, just making special things for a small audience that loves you is a much better business to do in a climate today than trying to have a scale business with speculative um, stock. Yeah, I feel like, I, to be honest, I quite love having a smaller business at the moment because mm -hmm. it's a lot more profitable. Um, it's fun you know and yeah i can go home and switch off at certain points without having to do extra work in the evenings the no coding world is just sort of changing everything right like mm -hmm. i think you can spin up websites now you can spin up like ai you can do a lot of your brand you know like canva could probably mm -hmm. you know do your job you know tomorrow if you ask them how is that changing and how is that affecting what's happening previously i think the interesting thing there is the strategies we do are generally pretty simple it's the execution and the change management is the kind of secret ingredient, mm. if you had to have a secret ingredient. Like when we say, hey, you know, um, Paul's boss, you are a fantastic business. Um, the, the team are, you know, world class. They've got fantastic metrics, um, you know, great uh, ARR for a very small team. They've got the best customers in the world, like all of their um, independent hospitality people, like name a cool restaurant or cafe, they're on Posbos. But the brand didn't reflect the energy of the team and their cool customers. And so we say, hey, move into the world of independent hospitality. That's a pretty simple strategy, right? Like, how do you how do you tell someone their baby's ugly though? Like their name and brand, like even before before you're doing this, how do you tell? How do you have that conversation? I don't think you do. I don't think that's a very good way to make friends. Yeah. I think what you do, and this is another reason that we're a bit different than a normal agency, 
we, and it sounds really pretentious, but it's 100% true. We run like an innovation process as opposed to a design uh, agency process. So a design agency kind of like does hardly any strategy or um, research. You know, you know, there are you know lots of people who do, do yeah. good research. I'm not not trying to um, you know be rude, but most most processes are light at that end, and then they do a lot of creative development, and then they show the client at the end and kind of go, here's three things, pick one, but we like this one, and then the client will pick bits out of the other two, and you end up with something that no one likes, and yeah. it's a really bad way to. Um, you wouldn't do product development like that. You wouldn't do anything else in your company like that, and so we do an innovation process where we get the team who's going to be part of the project to see all of the information as we go through so we set the strategy together we do the research and set the strategy together. and in that strategy we'll say you know what are we trying to do who are we trying to talk to how do we want to make them feel what do we want to be known for and then you can look at the current assets like the visual identity and the name and go is this helping or neutral or hindering our big mission and if you look at it and you go well actually that's not where we want to be because we don't want to be a tech company we want to be in the world of our customer then we all make the decision super easily and it's not really us you know mm. like we're just we're just running the process and we all make that decision so yeah we don't go around telling people their, their baby's ugly but we do go hey things that your customers love about you are not currently present in the website and I think you know because that's so so, so simple a lot of what we're doing and the execution is where it matters um yeah, I'm, I'm not like we use AI in every project now. Like mm. we um, come up with concepts in AI, we put it into our benchmarking and we use it to brief in photographers and people that are going to make the actual work. Um, I use AI to have arguments uh, with all day where I'm trying to like go be less corporate, uh, say it like a person would and come <laughs> up with kind of best, better ways to kind of like um, put, put things out. It helps me with naming. Like I, I love it. I think it's like any tool if you're really close to what your customer needs and what value you provide, it's just a great tool to provide more of that value. Yeah, I agree. I feel like everyone always asks me, is AI going to kill off your industry? And you know, I was like, oh, it's just going to create 10 times people, 100 times people. Mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, and there'll still be the other people that'll lose elements of their jobs because of it but i think it's just gonna with with the right people it's gonna help them do way yeah. better things and so i wouldn't want to be selling a grudge purchase that is incredibly uh systemized so if i was like a conveyancing lawyer i'd be like yeah i'd be retraining you know uh, yeah yeah mm. or like purely just punching out monotonous content you know you'd be like oh yeah um what is the future for you guys? Are you going to keep raising another fund? Are you going to yeah. like? Is it? Is have you guys proven that? Holy shit! I told you guys to take brand seriously, and now we're here and we're telling mm. you and we're showing you. Are you, are you at that point now? Yeah, I mean we're we're super excited about the world at the moment. It's so fun working with Ice House on on brand fund, and the kind of projects that have come in as a result of that, like the people at Menu Aid and the people at Health Now. I mean, they're world-leading companies. They're going to be massive. And yeah. it's so cool to then get to work with them and use brand to hopefully accelerate success. Like, our view with all this stuff is a you know, a really strong brand approach can supercharge a great product and team. But if you haven't got a great product and company and systems, it's it's not going to be the, the defining part of your success. You can't put lipstick on a pig. No, so it's only <laughs> going to work if you're pretty good. And yeah, so that's really cool. And we're really lucky that the first crop of companies we've invested in, including like Ideally and Tracksuit and Calo Curb, and you know, there's some great, great companies that are growing super fast. Mm. So yeah, we, we feel very lucky where, where that's going at the moment. That's a, that's really cool, man. I heard AF drinks used as a um, as an or as a way of describing non-alcoholic drinks. So like you know, I don't know, it's like AF drinks, and I was like, oh, that's when you know brand is like yeah. becoming its own thing, right? Well, they're making, and I don't know if people really appreciate yet just how amazing Lisa King and team are with this. But in the states, they were actually a little bit behind uh, England, especially, but here as well, in that. Non-alcoholic cocktails in a can just weren't really a thing. And so at Walmart and Target, you know, the two of the most influential, largest retailers mm. in the States, they are literally making new space on the shelves and putting a sign up saying non-alcoholic cocktail in a can. And AF Drinks is the first kind of thing that they're choosing to, to be on that new shelf. So and good. so they are really and truly leading a, a new category. And that's the kind of only 
CPG product that we'd invest in um, as we only want to invest in things that are actually making a new category, not just moving yeah. spend around within a category. Does that mean that you are going to continue working with Ice House to raise another fund, mm. or you're going to is like is it you're going to include other funds now, or is it purely just that relationship is pretty tied? Yeah, yeah, we'll be working with Ice House um, and and raising another. Like it's quite cool. We we thought when we raised, how much have you exhausted it for? Oh, like three odd, yeah. and it'll all be gone pretty soon, um, which is really cool because we thought that it would be a little bit longer before follow on opportunities would pop up. But we've already had like three pretty significant follow-ons within that same That's fund. So good. Within within a year. Like we only we only went live with it in um you know early 2023. So that's bananas. And like ideally, you, you gotta talk to the, the the crew at ideally. Like they are going so fast mm. and, and such a great team. I think Dan's trying to get them on at yeah, the yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> great Dan great. is, yeah. yeah. Dan's my Auckland counterpart mm. that gets all the guests up in Auckland mm. if you comment on a LinkedIn post like you yeah. do <laughs> yeah, well, th- thank you for uh, inviting me on and I invited oh, myself on I'm no, 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 so no. we talked about this for a long time yeah, right yeah, and yeah. so it was just the, the I was like that's the moment let's do mm. it what I'd love to talk to you about now is podcast stuff right mm. let's just like yarn about podcast how have you found it like it's a bloody hard podcasting, right? You can't just find great, easy to talk with guests all the time. It can be some can be challenging to pull their stories out. Mm-hmm. Like, how has it shaped you by learning all these like things over the years by listening to people on podcasts? Like, have you found it that it's helped you in business? Because I've definitely felt like yeah. I think I've just I like being the dumbest person in a room and being able to sit and just talk to really amazing people for the last eight hours today. You yeah. know, it's so good. But talk to me about your experiences. Well, I, I feel so lucky being on here. Like, this is the first podcast that I've ever done. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. <laughs> so, you know, I've been hosting one for a long time, but I've never said, um, I've not been invited on many, but haven't gone on. Um, and so, Thank yeah, you. loving it. Oh, wow, you're great. It's actually quite hard on the other um, side of it. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> finding it harder than I thought I would. Um, but yeah, it's such a privilege to do. And I think, you know, I, I love this podcast because, you know, it's so authentic and it's so true and it's also so niche to provide really strong value. Like the most useful podcasts are one where you're talking to a really defined audience about really detailed stuff. Because if you're too broad, yeah. it's kind of no one for nothing for no one, you know. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, I, I love this. Um, Who's but, been your favorite guest out of interest? Yeah, I love to get a different take on people who I know reasonably yeah. well. And so... You know, people like Nick Holdsworth or, or Barnaby uh, Marshall, you know, really enjoyed those chats because um, you get you do get another angle and the way that you're so disarming and put people at ease and make it really personal. It's it's really good. People get out of their uh, talk tracks. Yeah. Who've been your who's been the one you, you when you were hosting that surprised you the most? So the kind of goal of, of the podcast that I do, like we started seven years ago when there were no positive business stories yeah. and we wanted to show that, you know, business could be kind of not what you'd seen in the paper, which yeah. was just funding and fuck ups and yeah. old dudes becoming accountant, you know, accountants becoming company directors, becoming national party MPs, you know, it was yeah, a very yeah. kind of like gray um, kind of business approach. And we wanted to be like a magazine style where you saw how people could have creativity and you know more progressive and interesting approaches to business and just kind of change things up and so the best examples of those are things like Michelle Wilson from our period care who just tells the most phenomenal story of how her uh, tupuna kind of spoke to her in a dream and told her that she had to get into the forest and so she left like a hardcore law job that she'd worked so hard to get into and went and studied rongoa and then made this amazing sustainable period company and that she's doing it to be a good ancestor and she's such a fantastic speaker and the messages that she tells are so cool and you know her purpose animates her business and that kind of stuff that helps this this crusty old dude kind of understand another world I, I love that. Yeah, that, uh, that's like I love it when this disarming story is laid out in front mm. of you, you know, and especially in a topic that you're not knowledgeable in at all, mm. right? And you mm. just become o- almost like an audience member that sometimes I forget to talk, mm. but I'm like, oh, hang on, I've got to steer the ship a little bit here. And so, yeah, I, I love them. And the ones when you're a bit out of your comfort zone, but yeah, I really try to be like 95% guest, 5% me, because I've been doing it for 
seven years. And, um, you know, you know, sometimes when you listen to kind of four podcasts from a podcast you like in a row and at the end of it, you're like, oh, stop saying that, Dick. So I try not to have too much of me in there a lot of the time. Um, but yeah, sometimes I'll just get carried away. Yeah, nice, nice. And you've got all the fancy things of not editing, not doing all the marketing and stuff like that. So you can just do the cool stuff and yeah, walk away. Yeah, it's yeah I like such, that a lot. such a privilege. Hey, last thing I want to get on to before we, we finalize and get on to our final questions mm. is um, government. <laughs> and mm. like I read an inst- interesting post of yours yesterday or today, I can't mm. remember what it was, um, talking about the role of government in terms of funding. Mm. And, and this is a really topical conversation at the moment, especially in Wellington where I'm from, mm. is that where half the audience is probably saying, you know, the government should fund a lot of these initiatives and should do all these things. And the other half are saying, well, the government shouldn't do that. We should do it ourselves. And so um, I read your post and then thought I'd ask you that question is like, what what role does the public service and should they play in supporting our ecosystem? It's a really interesting debate, right? And in that we can't just spend anything on anything we like. And there have been some low value programs and those should be called out and culled. Uh, but where there's a massive goal to change the New Zealand economy, then that's worth investing in, right? And the government has a goal to increase the number of tech jobs, green exports, uh, remove our reliance on primary industries, like we need this for New Zealand. And if you're not going to be investing in it and just cancelling the existing programs that we're trying to uh, actually increase the number of people going into these careers, increase the support for people getting in them, uh, become a centre of like SaaS excellence uh, and tech excellence. Um, You can't just cancel them without a new plan. And so I think the concern that a lot of people have at the moment is that the ITPs, these big industry transformation kind of plan program things, they've all been cancelled wholesale across all of the areas. But there aren't currently plans to, you you know, what they're going to replace them with. So... um, See Tomorrow First is something that we, we worked on it previously and did the brand strategy for. And that was a really interesting process. And the, the goal of that was kind of like um, 100% pure New Zealand. Mm. That's the banner for all tourism activity. And it kind of sits above your regional and your marketing activity. And that See Tomorrow First is trying to give an identity to the tech industry. Because when we went out and researched it, what we found is that the rest of the world when they think of New Zealand, they do not think of tech. Mm. They think of the opposite of tech. They think of empty spaces, nice landscapes, nice people, not very kind of like modern cities. Like if they think of tech, they think of Silicon Valley and Singapore, mm-hmm. and you know, places that are buzzing. Tokyo. When they think of New Zealand, they think of a mountain and a beach and, you know, some very fun. harmless people. Yep. And that's not like tech. Tech's hardcore go forward. And so That's a big problem when you're looking for international investment and when you're wanting to create a halo so that when a New Zealand tech company turns up at a trade fair overseas and says, Hoi, I'm from New Zealand, they don't go, oh, what? Do you even have technology there? I just thought it was like Lord of the Rings backgrounds. People go, of course, cool. There's great companies from New Zealand. I'm already ready to do business with you. And it can happen, you know, like Israel's known as a centre of tech excellence, uh, Singapore, you know, you Mm. can actually create that. But it takes a lot of work and you've really got to build towards it. And so See Tomorrow First was a way to tell a story about the purposeful nature of New Zealand tech, leverage that idea that we're in tomorrow, which is if you do know anything about New Zealand and the States, it's probably that we're in tomorrow. Um, and just have like a hook that we can go out there with. And so that's just got rolling. It's been really successful so far. 100 million odd people have interacted with the content. Um, heaps of businesses were able to pick it up and run with it. The people at New Zealand Tech did a fantastic job of industry engagement, mm. taking everyone's ideas and putting them into the, the concepts and then making assets they could use. So that currently is in a limbo state. And so I was putting out a call to go, hey, government, it'd be really cool if you could jump in and keep this going because you can't make a national brand in a few months. Mm. You've got to you've got to work at it. Yeah, and, that, and that's what I worry about, right, is like the 10-year the roadmap of things, you know, if they're to break now, like we're, we're starting from scratch with mm. a lot of these initiatives, which are going to take, let's be honest, in government two years before mm. they can get off the ground, you know, and then the government will probably change, right, and then it'll start again. So it's, it's so hard when you see these long-term plays killed off and... yeah. 
Yeah. And SAS, you know, like it's actually remarkable that we have such a strong SAS scene. There's no reason that we should be such a global leader. And, you know, with the great success of companies like Zero and Pushpay that's helped to, you know, ch- ch- change our um, global standing, pretty good if the government can support the things to keep becoming a centre of excellence. And I think, like, you know, I've got a couple of big bugbears in this thing. And another one is that when they talk about tech jobs, they only ever really mean coders and STEM and STEAM, you know. But my experience of the tech industry is, like when we were at Vend, you know, we'd get these amazing retail managers. You go into a store that wasn't a Vend uh, customer and you get a great manager who was sparky and you go, Come on, work here. Hey, yeah. uh, do you want to be a custom support manager at a cool yeah. tech company? And then these people would come in and they'd be 27 or something, be great customer support people, and then they'd see product management. And no one knows what product management is until they get into a company. And they go, oh, I'd like to do that. And then they'd go and they'd learn that skill. And now there's people who came in from you know, working in retail, who are like some of the, you know, Jordan Lewis, one of the top um, product managers at, you know, Australia's greatest company, you know, like um, at Deputy and then um, Fonspar's at Canva, you know, there's all these people who have done this amazing journey. 100%. And a lot of them came from retail, had no idea that tech had jobs for them. And so we should be doing whatever we can to get more people considering a career in tech and pulling away that support seems to be so short-sighted. Yeah, yeah, I, I fundamentally agree with you. Mm. And I think, like, I, you know, I, I was at the a couple of events recently with um, Judith, and I think, I know, and I know Judith personally from a long time, from years ago, mm-hmm. and I know she's always been really passionate about tech and what the, mm-hmm. you know, what it can do for New Zealand. But I worry that we need to, like, the strike now, right? This is the time now where we need to keep getting in and supporting and investing. And so mm-hmm. there's some really cool initiatives that I hope yeah. continue to get funded. And, you know, you would have heard her speak at the High Tech Awards. Mm-hmm. What a great speech. But there's nothing to back it up in terms of them actually doing stuff. So yeah. I think a lot of the things that, 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 that they have as hopes and dreams will continue to be that unless they really get in and keep the momentum going and don't pull it away. And if we can get the idea out there that tech jobs are storytelling jobs, they're support jobs, they're finance jobs, they're operation jobs, there are so many people who could be living, you know, the the tech job life. It's a yeah. pretty sweet life compared to you talk to people in real jobs and they're like, what the heck? That's uh, amazing. I know. How many of the people did you meet at Venn that we, you changed their life overnight, mm. right, from taking them out of a retail store? Well, and-, and they changed their lives mm. by, you know, embracing software thinking, learning how to get better, mm. like, you know, becoming positive contributors to teams and just that whole paradigm of software thinking is so powerful. And then when you start working in some re- industries that aren't tech, you're like, oh, that's right. Yeah. Oh, it's all politics and bullshit. Yeah, interesting. Hey, so we, um, we're at that point of the podcast now where I'm going to ask you an, an, a question that was given to us by the previous guest, which was mm. Michelle. Do you know, you know Michelle? Yeah, so, yeah, Michelle. She's a hoot, hey. She goes, I don't think I've ever met Simon and he wasn't smiling mm. and just passionate about something. So she was like, can you ask him what makes him just so infectiously passionate about other people and their mm. things and, and how do you do that? Oh, man, I just love it. I feel like the luckiest person in the world. Like work is so interesting at the moment and the companies and the projects we're working on and the team's doing so well. And like, yeah, like it's just such an exciting space. And I remember when I first met Vaughn um, at, at Vend and he was like, oh, you know, nice to meet you. And I just like ranted at him. I was like, oh man, this move to the cloud feels like the biggest change in business since the internet. I can't wait to get involved. And he was like, oh yeah, uh, nice to meet you, man. Like, you know, kind of like, but yeah, I've always been like massively enthusiastic about things that make great sense to me and mm. always been super interested in, yeah, what makes people tick, like the way they think, the things they do. Yeah, love it. Yeah, awesome. So what question would you ask to the next guest without knowing who it's going to be? Like, what's a question that you'd really love to know the answer to? One question I always ask is, what will success be for you? And that's something that I've asked for the last, like, five or so years. And that's because you meet a lot of people who actually become wildly successful on a lot of kind of, you know, common metrics. And as as trite as it is, you know, money doesn't buy you happiness. Um, 
it's kind of true. Like, you, you know, yeah. like definitely like not having money buys you misery. And so above yeah. a certain kind of threshold, more money doesn't necessarily make for, for more happiness. And it's always interesting to find out what people consider to be success and how often it kind of links back to like doing something meaningful and leaving something meaningful. Mm. So I find that really interesting. Now I'm going to get you to answer the question yourself. So what defines success for you then? Yeah. Like. You seem to me like the epitome of a successful guy now that's followed a few of his passions into one melting pot now mm. and it's like really ignited you, you know, well, only from what I see mm. and read and but it seems like that. Um, but when will you know that you've been successful? I, I feel so successful at the moment. I feel so lucky that we've worked really hard as a team at previously to get a great process and really kind of like be these advocates for the role of brand. And every time we get to do a project and just work with these people who are engaging with it, like it just feels like Christmas. Like it's mm. very, it's very lucky. So I feel very successful. Um, at the moment actually and I had like you know one of those 10 year plans to be in VC and then we raised a VC fund and I've been learning so much about VC and loving that and looking forward to you know d doing more with a, with a bigger one in the future as well and so yeah feel feel very lucky like there's that whole thing that that I really um really believe and it's so cliche but the, the journey is the destination man and like if you're not finding joy in what's happening now Ah, man, you'd better not be hoping that you'll get to some point and then you'll be happy. And so, yeah, I try to stay very kind of present and, um, yeah, be, being grateful for, mm. for the opportunities and things we're doing. Yeah, I'm not sure about you, but most of the people that I've interviewed over the years or met that have completed something and have a lot of money now are inherently unhappy because mm. they haven't got a purpose, you know, and I think the journey mm. is the destination, right? It's and like, I just love making stuff and I feel like we're making some real good shit and so yeah. that's really, really rewarding. Well, I look forward to seeing what you guys continue doing. I think like you're really in your flow mm. state sweet spot at the moment mm. and it's been an absolute joy to chat to you, mate. So thank you so much for coming on. Ah, thanks so much for having me, man. Awesome. Simon's story talking about Ingrid Starnes for me, like is just testament to the man that he is. Like, if you know Simon, there's no way you hear it. They would have ever just given up on that business and given all that money, like not given that money back. What a phenomenal story. Like Ingrid and Simon are amazing people. I was so inspired by that story. I'm so inspired by Simon just like anyway. The guy just does the most amazing things and is like the pinnacle of how important brand is in like New Zealand. Um, I think the previously unavailable team are knocking it out of the park. They're doing some really cool stuff brand wise, but they're also doing some really cool stuff for the startup ecosystem in general now with caffeine and everything that they're doing and the equity swaps and the ice house partnership. And so it was an absolute pleasure to chat with Simon. You can't not like that guy. He's the, the loveliest guy. And it was just a joy to have him on as a guest. So thanks so much for letting me flip the table on you, Simon. And I can tell you for sure, man, your business is not boring. Thanks for joining. Thanks for watching. See you next week. This podcast is produced by Jono Tucker from Empire Films.